So my name's Robert Munro. I'm a computational linguist, uh, and that means that I make computers understand people, uh, mostly so that I don't have to. Um, so I run an organization called uh, Idibon. Uh, we work in text analytics uh, on a web scale. And the reason we do this is because uh, this is you on the left, the world. And on the right is your data. Um, a very small amount of the world's data is structured. Most of it is in plain text. And the largest growing segment is the 7,000 languages, which uh, you've probably never even heard of. Uh, but I'm not going to speak about that today. I'm going to speak about um, my passion for language and, and what drew me to this point. Um, so we have these things called linguistic frames of res uh, reference, so relative to me. So in front of me is this way. Um, intrinsic would be the room's front. So the room's front is this way, maybe because this is where the stage is. Absolute, I'm in the west of the room. And we have other divisions, like the difference between here and there, um, and time and space, so the events behind us, the events in front of us. Uh, these pattern differently in every single one of the world's 7,000 languages. And so you can imagine that this is important for something like you know, a GPS in a car, for example. Uh, so if it was telling you to turn right, well, you can't say that in a lot of languages which only have absolute reference. You'd have to say turn north, uh, for example. Um, in a lot of cases, here is exclusive. So if your GPS in your car was telling you exit here, it's saying that the car is going to keep going down the freeway at full speed, but you're expected to commando roll down the exit ramp. Um, so you want to get that translation right as well. Um, and not all languages encode the past as being behind us. Uh, some languages encode the past as being in front of us, because you know, we can see what we've already done. Um, so you'd want to turn right before five minutes in these languages, uh, otherwise you're sending this person and then a constant U-turn. Um, I'm going to talk about three uh, different initiatives that I've worked on uh, over the last three years, uh, about a tribe in the Amazon, about a nation, and then about the world as a whole. Uh, so starting with the tribe, uh, they're called the Matses. It's about 3,000 speakers, uh, language of the same name, uh, in the Peruvian Amazon. Uh, it's quite remote. Uh, it took about eight days to get there. Um, and it's the same valley as the so-called uh, uncontacted people that you've probably seen in National Geographic. Um, they're not uncontacted. They're just uninterested. Uh, they just don't want to take part in modern society. Uh, so I was there to study the language because it had a very unique property. So imagine someone said to you yesterday, I'm going to... Uh, the conference there tomorrow, speaking of here. You can quote them directly. You can repeat what they said. Uh, you know, he said, I'm going to the conference there tomorrow. Um, in English, we can also completely reframe what that was said to our own spatio-temporal and personal point of view. So he said he is coming to the conference here today. So I to he, going to come in there to here, tomorrow to today. Uh, we do this seamlessly without even thinking about it. We take other people's knowledge and observations and re-express them from our own spatial temporal point of view. This is not permitted in the Matzes language. Uh, you can rephrase what someone said as much as you like, but it still has to be from their spatio temporal point of view. Um, and what they lose in sophistication there, they more than make up for by having not one but three past tenses for different lengths of time in the past. And they distinguish here, there, there, far away. So they have greater spatial distinctions as well. Um, this came to a head in 2009 when the Peruvian government gave drilling rights um, in the Amazon. They decided that the native people only owned the first meter of their land and the oil companies could drill beneath it uh, in areas of some of the world's greatest uh, ecological diversity. Uh, there were widespread protests across the region. Um, there were blockades by indigenous communities. Uh, there were dozens of deaths in, in different locations. And it happened to be while I was there that um, oil companies uh, came to the Matzes as well to try and convince them to allow them to drill on their land. And I imagine that looks something like this. You had an oil executive who turned up and said, the officials in Lima say that this land right here is ours. But of course, you can't translate directly into Matzes because it's expressing it from his point of view, what the, the officials said. So translated, it was going to look something like this. The officials in Lima said long ago that that land far away is yours. And it loses a lot of the power when you translate it this way. Uh, so this is one fail in localization uh, to the point that the uh, officials were chased away with bows and arrows by the Matzes, um, which I thought was a great symbolic gesture because they mostly hunt with shotguns nowadays. Um, which meant that the Matzes could return to their uh, you know, traditional tasks, such as you know, playing football, volleyball, um, and pretending to be interested when linguists are asking them really annoying repeated questions. You know, like, is the box here or is it there? Um, he really did look bored in that photo, didn't he? I've never seen it blowing up so big before. Um, 
So second part, a nation. Um, in the wake of the 2010 earthquake in Haiti, um, communication lines were still open, but the responders did not speak Haitian Creole. Um, and I ran an initiative called Mission 4636. Uh, it's still the greatest use of crowdsourcing for humanitarian purposes today. And I did this from here in San Francisco by finding about 2,000 members of the Haitian diaspora I could come online and make these translations uh, before transferring this to paid summer source workers uh, after about the, the first six weeks. I, I believe uh, you saw summer source this morning. And you can see the importance of local knowledge there as well. So imagine that this message came in um, and you had to, if you're lucky enough to have the translation, find where OCAP is. So can anyone see OCAP on the map here? I'll give them a zoom in a bit. No? I'll have a zoom in again. Can you see OCAP? Not really. So it's actually slang, um, cap hashian, um, which makes sense. We're going to get cap with the K rather than the C. Um, but if you didn't already know this, it's going to be really, really difficult to find where this location is. Um, and if you do happen to know this location, you'd also know that Sacred Heart Hospital is actually 14 kilometers south of the capital um, in another village called Malat. Um, so this is the importance of local knowledge, and we saw uh, hundreds of interactions like this. So you have Delilah here in San Francisco, Apo in Montreal, collaborating with each other online uh, so that they can find uh, where one emergency message was located. So in this case, Delilah doesn't know where Thomason was, but on an online chat room, she's able to interact with Apo, who does, because she grew up there. Uh, and so even though uh, it wasn't labeled on any map at this time, he can click right where he knows it to be on the satellite view, because this is where he grew up. And we saw this for about uh, 45,000 messages that we streamed directly to the responders with an average turnaround of under five minutes. This is equivalent of several knowledge, uh, novels worth of uh, emergency messages uh, translated and mapped in real time. Um, and we can do the math on this and work out how important local knowledge is. Um, so uh, there are also international NGOs who have been labeled by others as disruptive, um, who also worked on mapping at this time and are able to process only about 3,000 messages with an average turnaround of more than four hours. Um, and so this is one instance where maybe encouraging people just to continue their linguistic practices is more important than introducing new disruptive or innovative technologies. OK, uh, so expanding it further to the world. So uh, last year, um, I was working as CTO of an organization called Epidemic IQ, trying to track all the world's disease outbreaks. So outbreaks are our greatest killer, but people are surprised to find that no organization is even tracking all the world's disease outbreaks. Uh, and this is especially scary when you consider in the last 75 years, we've only eradicated smallpox. Um, and yet there has been a great increase in um, uh, aeroplane travel. Someone just coughed over there when I said that. <laughs> That's really selfish of you. Um, again, this is a linguistic issue. 90% um, of the world's ecological diversity and therefore pathogens come from 10% of the world's land mass. 90% uh, of the world's linguistic uh, diversity is in that same 10% of the world's land mass, this uh, thin band in the tropics. And we can go back and find that some of the worst outbreaks of the modern age uh, were reported openly um, months, weeks, or even decades uh, before they're finally isolated by virologists and epidemiologists as being a new disease that um, we needed to track. So the, the race is on to track these as quickly as possible, identify them, and you know, work out strategies to, to stop the spread. Because uh, every single contagion uh, is a mutation for the virus and a chance for it to become much more virulent. Uh, so Epidemic IQ did this by a combination of uh, machine learning, natural language processing, uh, paid microtaskers, and in-house analysts. So across all the different languages from which we're able to pull uh, open data or data by partnerships with health organizations, we're able to pull out the, the keywords which told us uh, what the disease was, or maybe it was just a flu-like illness to begin with, um, where it was located, uh, how many people were infected. Um, and we're able to look at this case here in Germany. So, um, Germany is a tribe in a rainy continent in the north. They speak a language of the same name. Uh, they had an E. coli outbreak last year, an agricultural outbreak, um, which spread across the region. And no uh, big health organization at that time had all these German speakers on staff. Of, of course they didn't, who thought there was going to be a big outbreak there. Uh, so we were able to leverage uh, scalable machine learning and crowdsourcing to tap into large amounts of German speakers, quickly train up our artificial intelligences, and you can see here uh, us getting a head start in tracking this outbreak, in this case slightly ahead of the European Center for Disease Control. 
And one of the places we found these German speakers was uh, online. So um, there is a big use of online games within Germany, and so we're able to put these games inside virtual agriculture like Farmville and stop epidemics within Farmville in order to get structured information about the actual epidemic in Germany itself. Uh, so that's my talk about a tribe, uh, a nation, the world, and I guess a little bit of a virtual world as well. Um, so I just want to leave you with this thought. To, to love what is language is to love what is local. Thank you.